Hello and welcome to the first chapter of the Lambda Cube Unboxed. In this video we're going to introduce the ONTYPE Lambda Calculus which provides a basis for all the systems we're going to cover later on. Before we start, just a quick note. You might be familiar with the Lambda functions that are used in programming languages such as Python or JavaScript. They play the role of anonymous functions and they make use of normal mathematical language. These Lambda functions are not the same as the Lambda terms of a Lambda Calculus. A lambda calculus provides a whole new language which doesn't use traditional mathematical expressions or even numbers. With that said, let's get started. So assume we want to translate a function from normal mathematics into the lambda calculus. Let's take for example f of x equals x squared plus 1. The name of the function isn't really needed, so first we can write it as an anonymous function. x maps to x squared plus 1. In the lambda calculus, we would write this function as lambda x dot x squared plus 1. The lambda denotes what variable is abstracted and a dot denotes what is abstracted from, so the beginning of the function body. This is called abstraction. Now you might have noticed that x squared and the addition are functions too. These functions would have to be translated into the lambda calculus as well. The way we wrote them down, they're not part of the lambda calculus, and the same goes for numbers. It is possible to construct these functions and natural numbers, and we're going to do so in video 3 of this chapter. But for now, we're going to stick to this informal version. So, how can we apply a number to this function f and compute the outcome? First, we write f of 5, then we substitute every occurrence of x in x squared plus 1 by 5, and then we compute the parts step by step. So this is 5 squared plus 1, which equals 25 plus 1, which obviously equals 26. For the lambda calculus, we need substitution, some form of computation, and the means to express apply f to 5. The apply f to 5 part is actually fairly easy. We first write down the term again, so lambda x dot x squared plus 1. Then we put it in brackets, and we write the 5 behind it. This is intuitively called application. Lambda terms are mainly made up of these two operations. We're now going to look at the formal definition, then cover some notation and easy examples, and lastly, we're going to see how we can use substitution on lambda terms so that we can define computation in the next video. Okay, let's start with the formal definition. We have a finite set of variables v, and the variable rule says that a variable is a lambda term by itself. The application rule says if we have two lambda terms m and n, then m applied to n is also a valid lambda term. And lastly, the abstraction rule says that if we have a variable x and a lambda term m, then lambda x dot m is a valid lambda term. Maybe the simplest meaningful lambda term one can construct is the identity function, lambda x dot x. It takes a variable x as an input and then just outputs it again. Of course, we're not restricted to only one input. We can also easily construct a lambda term that has two inputs, lambda x dot lambda y dot x. This term takes two variables x and y and returns x. Although this term might seem a bit redundant, it's going to come in handy when constructing booleans in video 3. We might even want more inputs, such as, bear with me now, lambda m dot lambda f dot lambda x dot f applied to m applied to f applied to x. This term computes the successor of an input number m, as we're going to see in video 3 of chapter 1. Now, if we look at such a term with three, four, or even more inputs, it can get quite unwieldy quite quickly, especially if we use inconsistent variable names and maybe use small letters like a small m together with a capital letter like f, and maybe even a number like three as a variable. This is quite uncommon and it should definitely be avoided. Some terms also contain a few unnecessary parentheses, which aren't really needed to understand the term, and they just make it more difficult to read. To get rid of such inconsistencies and confusions, we're going to fix a few conventions that are going to help us write much more legible lambda terms. Firstly, we will always denote variables by a lowercase letter such as x, y, z and variants of these. Secondly, lambda terms will always be denoted by uppercase letters such as l, m, n and variants of these. And lastly, we're going to denote syntactical identity by the equivalence sign. Syntactical identity means that two terms are either exactly the same, or they just differ by some redundant parentheses. So xz in brackets is equivalent to xz without the outer brackets, but both are not equivalent to xy in brackets. 
we agree on even more redundant parentheses. In most cases, we don't need the outermost parentheses of a lambda term, so we're going to omit those. In an application, we associate the terms by default from the left, and so we can leave out the corresponding parentheses. So, m applied to n in brackets, applied to l, means the same as just m applied to n applied to l. In abstraction, on the other hand, we associate from the right. So, lambda x dot opening bracket lambda y dot m closing bracket is equivalent to lambda x dot lambda y dot m. If this seems confusing at first, just remember how we would read the notion f of x, y. We read the inputs from left to right, first x, then y. This corresponds to the right association of abstraction. First we read lambda x dot, and then lambda y dot. The last convention combines the two notions and says which has precedence. Application binds stronger than abstraction, so we can omit the parentheses after the dot. With these notations at hand, let's look at some more complex lambda terms to get a feeling for them. Starting with the identity function again, this time without the unnecessary brackets. So we get just lambda x dot x. The next example is a term that takes an x and applies it to itself. Lambda x dot x applied to x. Although this might not make a great deal of sense if we think of applying a number to itself, if x was a function, we would get recursive self-application, which is a very important concept in mathematics. Think about the factorial function, for example, or the recursive definitions of binomial coefficients and so on. The term lambda x dot lambda y dot lambda z dot x applied to yz can be used as a concatenation of two functions, maybe f and g, so f of g of x. If you think that's difficult to see, then let me rename the variables for you. The variable x becomes f in the abstraction and in the term. y will be named g, and lastly z becomes x. Now this looks quite similar to executing f and g one after another. The last two examples are two terms, which we will properly construct in video 3. Addition and a function is 0. Addition returns m plus n for some input values, and is0 returns the boolean value true if the input number is 0 and false if it's not. Alright, so far we've covered the very basics of the lambda calculus. In order to define computation, we need a few more tools. The first tool will be the notion of bound and free variables in a lambda term. The variable x in lambda x dot x is bound to the lambda. We call this a bound variable. Any variable that is not bound is free. We define the set of free variables of a lambda term recursively, just as we did with lambda terms. Since the definition of the set of bound variables is quite similar, we're going to leave that one to you as an exercise. The variable rule tells us that every variable by itself is not bound, it's free. If we have an application m applied to n, the set of free variables of that term is the union of the free variables of m and the free variables of n. And lastly, if we have an abstraction, lambda x dot m, the x is bound to the lambda, and so it's not free. So we take all free variables of the term m, and have to take out the bound variable x. Let's take a look at two simple examples. We want to know the free variables of the term lambda x dot x applied to y. One can easily see that it should be y and x is bound, but we're going to compute it with the recursive definition to get used to this notion. Feel free to pause the video at this point and try it out for yourself. Since the term consists of an abstraction, we need to use the third rule of the definition. So we compute the free variables of the term x applied to y without x as x is bound. xy is an application, so the free variables of xy are the free variables of x together with the free variables of y, and we still need to take out x. In the end, we get the set x and y without x. So y is the only free variable and x is bound, and this is exactly what we expected. Okay, so that one was pretty easy. Let's look at another example. x applied to lambda x dot xy. This term consists of an application. Following the second rule, we have to take the union of the free variables of the term x and the free variables of the term of our first example. By the variable rule, we get x as the free variable of the left term. And from the first example, we know that in the right term, y is free and x is bound. But this means that this term has x and y as free variables, and x also as a bound one. So there may be two occurrences of a variable x in a term, where one occurrence is free and the other is bound. 
And this is problematic when we get to computing, where we should not mix up whether an occurrence of a variable is free or bound. There are quite a few approaches to deal with this problem. One is called name-free notation by De Bruyne, where no names are used for bound variables at all. You can find out more about this notation in the literature section of the ISIS course. However, the most common approach, and the one we're going to stick to, is called alpha conversion. We're going to identify terms which only differ in the names of bound variables. In mathematics, names don't affect the behavior of the functions, whether you call it f or g or anything else. This holds for the names of functions as well as for the names of bound variables. For example, the function x squared plus 1 is expressed by f of x equals x squared plus 1 and g of y equals y squared plus 1 alike. Both express calculate the square of the input and add 1 to it. They compute the same output and their structures are exactly the same. The only difference between them is the name of the bound variable and the name of the function. Since terms in the lambda calculus don't have names like f or g, we don't need to worry about that. We say that two terms are alpha convertible, denoted again by the equivalent sign, if they only differ by the names of the bound variables. After this slide, we're just going to call such terms identical and use the equivalent sign. If you remember, so far we used the equivalent sign to denote terms which are exactly the same or that differ by redundant parentheses. With this alpha convention, we can just assume that free and bound variables have different names by default and we're not going to run into problems like in the term above. So the term x applied to lambda x dot xy could be renamed to something like x applied to lambda z dot zy. This term now has x and y as free variables and the variable z as the only bound one. Be careful though that you don't rename the free variables by accident. These two terms would not be alpha equivalent to z applied to lambda x dot xy, for example, since we renamed the free occurrences of x and not the bound one. We're going to make one more assumption which will prevent us from running into trouble. This is called the Barendrecht convention and says that the names of bound variables should be pairwise different. So lambda x dot xx applied to lambda x dot xx would not be allowed. This is desirable for a similar reason as with free variables. We might get into trouble distinguishing variables. Lambda x dot x applied to lambda x dot xx is a different term than lambda y dot y applied to lambda x dot xy. But distinguishing between the two occurrences of x in the first term is not possible. So now we know how to distinguish free from bound variables. To be able to compute something like lambda x dot x squared plus 1 applied to 5, we need to be able to insert the input. So how do we substitute every occurrence of the variable x by the input 5? We denote this notion by x squared plus 1 and then square brackets and inside x is defined as 5. Once again, we have a recursive definition for all the cases of lambda terms that we could have. The simplest case speaks about substituting into a term which just contains a variable. If it's the same variable that should be substituted, we can just substitute and get the input. So substituting x by n in the term x would yield n. If the variable is a different one, for example y, and we want to substitute x by n, then there is no x, so there's nothing to substitute and we would just get y again. Now let's look at the more recursive steps. If we substitute in an application pq, so p applied to q, we can just substitute x in both terms p and q. And if we have an abstraction lambda y dot p, we can pull the substitution into the abstraction to p. Be careful though, here the alpha conversion is very important because it could be the case that the bound variable y occurs freely in n. So when we substitute n for x, we wouldn't know which of the y's is bound and which is free. I'll show you an example of this lambda y dot yx, where we substitute x by lambda z dot zy. If we blindly follow the substitution definition, we would get lambda y dot y applied to lambda z dot zy. And the free variable y from the last term is suddenly bound. But we have the alpha conversion. So we know that after renaming, y would not occur freely and bound in the same term at the same time. The term would be something like this, lambda y1 dot y1x with 
x substituted by lambda z dot z y, which yields lambda y1 dot y1 applied to z dot z y. In this term, we can see that the y1 and y are different variables, and so we won't confuse them. So to wrap it up, we formally defined lambda terms, which are able to represent functions as we know them from mathematics. We covered some notation and syntax rules. And lastly, we looked at substitution for those lambda terms to prepare for the definition of computation in the next video. In the next video, we're also going to discuss what a result of a function could be. Thank you very much for listening, and see you next time.